they used to pray for the healing, maybe a flu or something. And then I'd start to think, well, I think I got a sore throat still. Oh, actually, I do have a sore throat still. And boom, 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 bam, I'm sick. And I learned something fresh and new. That once I pray for the healing, I'm expecting the signs to disappear, the signs of a sickness, and the signs of his kingdom to invade. And if I feel like I still have the signs of sickness, I ignore them, and I start praising God for the healing and the miracle that he's doing. Because I'll be honest with you, I don't think any one of us should ever live on the face of this earth as a believer in Jesus Christ with the concept that we're not healed. See, Jesus did something 2,000 years ago. And those stripes that were lashed across his back was for a purpose, so you and I could de declare the miracle. So if you really think about it, in heaven, there's no need for a miracle. On earth, we need the miracle. So in heaven, there's not really miracles. On earth, heaven invades it, and it just becomes heaven on earth. Because it becomes heaven on earth, the sickness just doesn't get in the way. Now, in saying that, I have loved ones that have passed away. My mom passed away at, with cancer. And she looked me in the face as I'm praying for her healing. She looked at my face and said, son, I'm, I'm going to be healed. Ultimately, I'm healed. And she felt in her heart that God had called her home. I'm like, yeah, but I was only 20, what, 24 years old at the time? Huh? 24? I'm like, no, God, I, I, think, I think mom's missing it. I mean, she only had four generations of ministry in her life, but I think she's missing it. She's only a missionary for over 50 years, but somehow she's missing it. But you know what? She had complete peace. No morphine, no drugs, just peace. Doctor said she should be in excruciating pain. No, not mom, just peace. I just came in, sit by the, by the bedside and read scripture to her. And she breathed her last. She's not dead. I believe that we're to be transferred from glory to glory. Now nah, your physical body is going to come to an end. You know what? I've looked in the mirror over the last 20 years and realized that my physical body is going to come to an end. Because it seems like it's coming to an end. I've got more gray than I ever have before. You know, I try to keep up with my kids skiing. It doesn't work as well anymore. I realize it's coming to an end. But I'm not dying. I don't want a false theology going on here. I'm going from glory to glory. And if I, if I get transferred from glory to glory, it must mean I'm in glory now. Because if we're not living in glory now, then how do you get transferred from glory to glory? And so how do you live in glory now? Well, don't let this world get in the way. Because his glory is not. See, his glory isn't concerned with everything else in this world. His glory is glory. In that, he has created us and designed us to go into all the world and preach the gospel. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, and cast out devils, demons. Sometimes demons aren't the little black, dark demons. Sometimes the demons are just our own mind thoughts. I'd say the greatest demon that we have is not getting a renewed mind. So if I get sick, I just don't let it affect me. And it seems to end very quickly. Matter of fact, I just don't seem to get as sick anymore. <laughs> Before it used to depress me. Oh, I can't be sick. I got to travel. I got to get on a plane. Got to do this and that. Got to do this and that. So don't let it affect you. Live in the glory. Now. Now. Live in the glory now, in his presence, his love, love that we don't deserve. But yet he says, I created you to deserve it. Favor that we don't deserve, but yet God says, I created you to deserve my favor. I have created your mind to be renewed. So you think like my son Jesus did. 
and walk sinless on this earth. We get so wrapped up in problems and issues. I had a, a good a friend pass away, Larry Keeler, this last week, and I want to honor him. He's an amazing man of God. My wife has known the Keelers for many, many years, and but you know what? <laughs> He's healed. And I don't know about the cloud of witnesses, but I have a feeling. I have a feeling that my mom and dad, they watching me. Maybe they're praying for me with no more earthly limitations. I don't know for sure. I don't, don't mess with your theology, but sometimes it's good to mess with your theology because I have theology too. I went to six years of seminary. And now I don't teach much of what I learned in theology. Remember, theology, theosohelia, what does it mean? Man's study or man's interpretation of the Bible. You see, God doesn't have a theology. He has truth. Theology is not a, it's not a term of heaven. It's a term of man on earth trying to decipher what this book means. But let me tell you something. If you try to figure out a meaning and you process, I did thesis statements. I spent months doing thesis statements. And now I read that same chapter. And I wished I had read it in today's light because there's so much more in the word than what I studied over and over again. It's like a living Word of God, because it is. It's revelation upon revelation. It, it, even this book, it says that if, if all the books wrote down the words of God, this world is too small to actually contain the books of his words. And so my heart and passion is that, of course, we have to have fundamental theology. We have to have the foundation of the word in us, deep in us. But I want to say when denominationalisms or our understandings or how we do family or how we do life, let's not celebrate that as God says. Let's just celebrate it as a family doing something. Because when we celebrate diversity within a family, standing on the foundation of the Word of God, the secondaries of Scripture, they don't have the heavy importance of what the primaries did. I'm not saying the secondaries of Scripture don't have importance. They absolutely do. But we create theologies upon theologies. Let me guess. Let's see. I went to a church for many years. I grew up in it where that was the devil's instrument right there. And we had no drums. We would never, ever consider something like that because it's not big enough with strings. And so what did I do? I started playing guitar. And I had one of these. And so we didn't have, yeah. It's coming. Touching someone else's guitar is like touching someone else's motorbike. So I just, no, it's kidding. It's, since we didn't have it in the church, I loved the music. And so I loved rock and roll. Actually, I had my hair long. Anybody remember long hair? <laughs> and I started at 15 years old, a guitarist in a rock band doing the local bars and clubs here in the Pacific Northwest. Missionary kid. Parents were senior representatives for Wycliffe Bible Translators. They, maybe people called me the black sheep. I don't know what I was. 1982, a motorcycle accident should have taken my life on I-5, 90 miles an hour. We didn't have kilometers back then up here, 90 miles per hour. Slid along I-5, God saved me and rescued me. Gave my life back to Jesus and then started going to seminary. They made me cut my hair. Started to listen to Christian rock and roll. Yeah, Petra. Striper. They were a little different because their pants were a little tight, but why do I say this? Because I would have said my theology was taught to me that devil's instrument, devil's instrument, 
But then I actually did a little bit of a study and realized that the piano came into the church in England in the late 1800s, early 1900s. A pastor took it from a local bar. That was the first time a piano had come into the Christian church that we know of in England, anywhere. And 75% of his church left that Sunday. Oh, Lord, I thank you that we have hearts and minds of change. Because I saw a bunch of young people up here excited. And I want to tell you, if we don't change, don't ever expect them to do the revival that you are called to do. Because if you expect it to go on their age group without having testimony from their own parents and grandparents, then you failed at your job for bringing revival. It's funny, I was talking to Sharon the other day and I talked to her once in a while. <laughs> Sharon's my wife, 30 years, beautiful marriage. Um, as we were talking the other day, I, was, I had music on through, the, through our trailer. I live in a trailer right now. It's a fifth wheel. It's not actually the big mobile home. That would be nice. That would double or triple our square footage, but for now I live in an RV. Anyways, uh, but it has speakers in the living room and in the bedroom, and so I had them on. I said, it's okay, I'm getting ready. I got a busy day, and so I had some, uh, some of my worship music on TFK or a Thousand Foot Crutch, if you know. Anyways. And so I said, is that okay, sweetheart? I have it on. She said, yeah, absolutely. And so we're going. And I had a thought. I said, I walked up to Sharon as this TFK is playing. And, and I said, you know, it's interesting. My mom, my mother, she was born in 1918. Dad was born in 1916. Mom was a radical. At 15 years old, she'd get on the bus in Kamloops, come down on a Friday night after school, and she would go down to Davie Street and help and clean up and pray for the prostitutes Friday night, Saturday and get back on the bus to get home for church. Sometimes she would do church with the prostitutes. I don't even know how my, my grandparents let her do it at 15 back then, because that'd be in like the 30s or eight, late 20s, early 30s. And uh, anyways, um, I said, you know, she was called a radical because she actually loved waltz music, waltzing. And she was ostracized somewhat, you know, from the church a little bit there because she was actually a radical because of waltzing music. I said, I got Christian rock and roll playing, getting me ready for an amazing day with God. I said, and Sharon said something like, yeah, it's interesting, you know. We listen to the same music as our kids and we love it. <laughs> I think that's the way it's supposed to be. Oh, that was a little slap for the parents, wasn't it? But anyways, that's okay. Christian music, all our kids love. Okay let's, let's, okay, let's turn to Matthew, uh, chapter 3, starting in verse 13. I'm going to read some scripture, and I'm going to show some pictures and read some more, and then I'm going to get to, hopefully, the Beatitudes, and we'll start that process and see how far we get. Amen? So John chapter 3, verse 13. Then Jesus, this is John the Baptist, baptizing Jesus. Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. And John tried to prevent him, saying, I need to be baptized by you. Are, you. are you coming to me? So Jesus comes to be baptized by John. John's in honor, like, whoa, like, seriously, dude, I, I'm looking for you. I'm, I've been declaring you from what your fa father said. So, and I've been eating locusts, and I stink like camels, and I should be getting baptized by you, but God has this other plan. Verse 15, but Jesus answered and said to him, permit it to be so now. <laughs> oh, that would just aggravate people if I said that here in the church. Go do this now. It would probably offend people. People get so offended. Sometimes I look the wrong way at someone and they get offended. I didn't give them a hug on the Sunday morning and they're offended. I'm like, come on, guys, I'll hug you every day. I just didn't, my mind was thinking something somewhere else, I don't know. Permit it to be so now. For thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. And then he allowed him. Verse 16, when he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him. And suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, this is my beloved Son in whom 
I am well pleased. Let's show some slide, the first set of pictures here. I think it's about, I, I was in the Jordan River baptizing. And it was actually really awesome because we did this trip. My wife and I have always wanted to go to Israel. And the Russians invited us. So we colluded with them. And uh, we did. We planned the trip. And so we went with 52 Russians. And uh, so here's the actual Jordan and an area where a lot of people get baptized. And so we baptized both Pastor Andre and myself. Pastor Andre, uh, his church is, I think, about 2,500 people in Yaroslavl, Russia. I've ministered there last fall. He's asked me back again for the largest youth conference in all of Russia. Fifteen countries come. We, I ministered last year at it, and he wants me to back again this year. I'm really excited about it. And uh, anyway, so he baptized half, I baptized half of the team. And, uh, and then... A lady, as it was all finishing, a lady stood up, a lady came that wasn't in our group, and she asked, and she said, are you a pastor? I said, yes. She said, there's a, a small group of us, and we have no pastor here or anyone to baptize us. Would you be willing to baptize me? And of course, I said, no. <laughs> of course, I said, yes. So let's go ahead. I said, of course, I will. <laughs> Keep going. And here she is. So this lady is from Peru. And I grew up in Peru. I was a missionary kid. So I started speaking to her in Spanish and baptized her. Let me go to the next one. So then this lady was from China. And so she came down and asked. And I said, sure. So I baptized the Chinese lady. Let's go ahead. And this one was, I think she was, one of them was from Japan somewhere. I can't remember what she was from. And so I baptized her too. Go ahead. This one was uh, Argentinian. So I think she had German roots in her, but she's Argentinian. And so we baptized her. What's the next picture? This one was, I think, the Japan. It was a China and a Japan. I might have them backwards, but either way, nations were being baptized. Let's go to the next picture. And then I asked Pastor Andre to baptize me in the Jordan. I was baptized when I was a little kid. I was saved at 8 and baptized at 12, is what we did. And so it was exciting. So that's Pastor Andre. His church is large, and he oversees 50 other churches in Russia. He was just with Papa Bill Johnson and sent pictures of him and Papa Bill. Um, and Papa Bill Johnson said to Pastor Andre, please give my love to Brent and Sharon and the family and all that they do. So it's pretty exciting. Let's go to the next picture. Oh, yeah, okay, so that's, see, Sam knows my, my schedule, so this is beautiful. Thank you, Samantha. Okay, so then for, uh, chapter 4, Satan tempts Jesus. We're not going to go down that road. He, after he got baptized, the Holy Spirit led him into the desert, and, uh, and for 40 days, the devil went after him. How many of you know Jesus did not fail? Amen? He became the perfect testimony. If you really want a good theology, Jesus would be perfect theology, okay, so... Whatever Jesus did, that's a good interpretation of the Word of God, <laughs> okay? <laughs> Amen? We good with that? So uh, we'll scroll on down to verse 12 of chapter 4 of Matthew, and Jesus begins his Gal Galilean ministry. Now, when Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, he departed to Galilee. Leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum. Where's that next slide? I know, I'm... Capernaum. And so I'm going to show you Capernaum now. Is that okay? Okay. Uh, Nazareth came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is by the sea in the regions of Zebulun and Naphtali, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, uh, by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who sat in darkness have seen a great light, and upon those who sat in the region in, sh in shadow of death, light has dawned. Verse 17 of chapter 4. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, 
repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That was in Capernaum. And Capernaum was right near Tiberias, where Sharon and I stayed in Tiberias, and then we got on a boat, an old boat, and we went along the Sea of Galilee, and I, I, I walked on the water, I'm sorry, I wanted to walk on the water, and so um, for some reason my faith wasn't high enough to jump off because it was quite a tall boat. And uh, my excuse was that Peter, his boat would have been a lot shorter, and he just stepped over. I would have had to actually jump, and I wasn't quite sure if the faith of buoyancy was going to work for me or not. But so I thank Pastor Andre because he actually grabbed a bottle of water and poured it on the deck, and I did walk on water on the Sea of Galilee. Amen? (laughs) But John the Baptist was declaring, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. See, John had had an experience in the desert. Something revealed to him, which we know as Father, which is with Father God, which is why Jesus later declares John the Baptist is the greatest of all prophets. John the Baptist started to declare, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. What that expression means is that the kingdom of heaven is so touchable, so close that it's touchable. And of course, all, some theologies would say, well, he was declaring Jesus Christ. Absolutely. But now Jesus Christ isn't declaring himself as much as he's declaring what's around him. And out of that, Jesus Christ became the doorway for you and I to have salvation to be able to experience a supernatural realm that's around us. For the kingdom of heaven is touchable. That's what the expression means. It doesn't mean, oh, I'm, I'm at hand with my wife right now. No, I have to be close enough to touch her. When I can touch her, I'm at hand. So Jesus is now starting his ministry, and he's saying in Capernaum, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Let me show some pictures of Capernaum. Let's go ahead. So that the synagogue is is newer. This walls and stuff are the actual old original buildings of Capernaum. Keep going. It's actually quite a large area. Keep going. You can just see, eh? I mean, it's absolutely, look at, look at some of the pots and the different things. You can see the Sea of Galilee down there. Keep going. Still parts of Capernaum. And keep going. This is just one side, kind of like that would be the east side of, Caper- of Capernaum. Next. They've tried to, you know, they're trying to collect the artifacts, which is really cool. Next. The city of Capernaum. Into this building is Peter's mother-in-law's house. Remember Peter's mother-in-law? It's right to the right, their house. Many miracles done on this land, city of Capernaum. Listen to the birds. Okay, next. These are some pictures. uh, I think uh, that's, yeah, what's left of Peter's mother-in-law's house. And they've built uh, a whole building over it with glass that you can look down into it because they want to keep it protected next. Oh, there's the Sea of Galilee. Who's those two people? Look at that. Look at that, it looks like we're on the water right now, except for that lady down there. But maybe she's, I don't know. She's sinking, we're floating. <laughs> Matthew chapter 4, verse 18. Matthew 4, verse 18. And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, right there, saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And then he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. They immediately left their nets and followed him. I think this is so important. When God speaks, we do. We just do it. But get some wise counsel too. I mean, a lot of people hear God speaking, but it's, it's a lot of emotions going on. And that's why we really need to have a family where people really want to see us advance. And it brings, it brings wisdom amongst each other, Amen. Verse 20, they immediately left their nets and followed him. 21, go on from there. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets. He called them. And immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. 
Verse 23, Jesus heals a great multitude, and Jesus went about all Galilee teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease among, disease among the people. So the beach that we were on there, and we're going to show some pictures in just a minute, just off the right side of the beach is a stream that comes in, and you can see the fish churning in the, in the water because the stream's bringing fresh nutrients. Many of us fishermen know that if you're in a big body of water and you fish the mouth of a river, you have, you have a good, good concept of getting some success. These guys are professional fishermen. That's right where they would have been fishing. It's literally just below Capernaum, and it's also just below the feeding of the 5,000, like walking did. We literally walked from the feeding of the 5,000 where the, the bread and the fish were multiplied and literally walked down to the beach. And so this was all happening on this beach. So uh, verse 23, and Jesus went about all Galilee teaching in the synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease, among, disease amongst the people. 24, then his fame, his fame, his name, people started to know him. He started to become famous. I don't like the theology that you're not supposed to be famous. Oh, I'm not supposed to be famous in man's eyes. Really? He was, Jesus was famous in man's eyes. Because when you do God's kingdom work, I will guarantee you, you'll have one of two responses. One, you'll become famous in man's eyes. Two, you'll be completely slammed on the other side as false. Those are usually your two options. I'm not trying to be famous, but what I am trying to be is that when people see me, they see the name of Jesus Christ all over me because he's the famous one. But you know, this whole concept of, you know, I'm just a dirty, wretched sinner. I'm weak. I'm poor. I'm destitute. Uh, I, I, I have no future other than when I die. That's, just, that's bad theology. Yeah, you're a dirty, wretched sinner. But what happens when you got saved? If you still live a dirty, wretched sinner's life, then I wonder about your salvation. <gasps> Brent, I said the sinner's prayer. What sinner's prayer? It's not even in the Bible. Oh, sure, confess with your mouth, as Roman says, absolutely. Believe on Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, absolutely. But when I married my wife over 30 years ago and I stood in front of her and I said, I do, it didn't give me instantaneous perfected marriage. It was a covenant and a commitment that I gave to my wife 30 years ago, till death do us part. And yes, she tried to kill me a few times, but till death do us part. You see, I do as a covenant. I believe in Jesus as a covenant that I will continue to pursue him in every area of my life. I used a sinner's prayer. I was saved at Billy Graham crusade. My family was in relationship with the Grahams from years ago. And the next crusade, Billy Graham, my parents took me, I got saved again. And I got saved the three times there at Billy Graham's crusade. They just were all a year apart. <laughs> Tell you what, you sit in a Billy Graham crusade, I guarantee you're going to want to go forward. Amazing man of God. Then his fame went through all Syria. And they brought to him all sick people who were afflicted with various diseases and torments and those who were demon-possessed, epileptics, and paralytics. And he healed them. It's interesting, the word demon-possessed isn't in all the tra translations. Possessed is in all of them, but demon isn't. <laughs> Yay, amen. And torments in those who were possessed. I think you can be possessed by many things. Possessed is when something other than yourself is controlling you. It sounds like some marriages doesn't. No, I'm just kidding. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> uh, possessed is when something other than yourself is controlling you. It controls your emotional state. It controls your joy. It controls your happiness. Like that brand new car, men, you know, when we get that car or that beautiful antique classic car and then it breaks, you know how depressed we get? Or when your, your loved one drives it and puts the first dents and scratches in it, you know how we feel? 
were possessed by that car. Because it can change our emotional state. Hmm. Anyways. Verse 25. Great multitudes followed him from Galilee and from Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and beyond the Jordan. We got so blessed because we went to all of those places. Now we're going to get into chapter 5. And seeing the multitudes, he went up on the mountain. And when he, seated, when he was seated, his disciples... Oh, do I have more pictures? I think I had more. I probably went right by. Do the Galilee one, or the next one's in line. Okay, there's Galilee. See Galilee. Here it is again. Yeah, that's it. Next. See, I'm asking the Lord, can I walk? But I didn't hear him calling me. So, next. Ooh. That's from Galilee. It's radioactive. No, I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. It's, uh, my wife wanted to eat it, so I ate some. Next. Here we are. Um, just pause for a moment. So, here's Capernaum. Here's where the feeding of the 5,000 took place. The fish and bread were multiplied. Walk right down here is that Sea of Galilee beach where the disciples were called. And later, when Jesus rose, went back, and they were fishing all night, remember? And he said, cast your nets on the other side, that same place. So now we're at the feeding of the 5,000. Go ahead. Here we are um, where the, the fish and the bread was multiplied in the feeding of 5,000 when uh, Jesus broke the five loaves of bread and the two fish and sent his disciples amongst 5,000. We know it was 5,000 men, but all their wife and children were probably there, so it's probably a, a number much larger than 5,000. But we're here and I thought I'd take a video I just felt like a declaration of multiplication to go out to, to you, to our own ministry of Windward and all of the churches uh, that we, uh, we help and, and speak into all around the world. But to you, if you're in your family, if you're single, if you're a single mom, if you are married, if you have uh, a business, if you have a ministry of your own, we just I feel to encourage you for the feeding of the 5,000, the multiplication. I feel like the, the Lord is laying on my heart right now that break something in two pieces or three and, and give to others. Or if you have two of something, give one to someone else. Or if you have need, uh, give out of your need uh, and watch the multiplication. Even in giving offerings and tithing, like give out of the need. Uh, not Not so you get a guaranteed increase, even though that is what the word of the Lord is clear on. But I just feel like give is way better than not to give. And we need to, if we're gonna see multiplication in your lives, our lives, our ministries, our families, we have to be a blessing in giving. And so I wanna encourage you, uh, right here, we just came from the, the Sermon on the Mount, uh, we, now here we are just outside of Capernaum, uh, at, literally on the spot, where the feeding of 5,000, the miraculous, took place. And I just want to encourage you, I just, as, as I've walked through this place and in such a great display that they have here, I just want to encourage you, I just felt in my spirit, encourage everybody that it's the season and time for multiplication. In faith, bless someone, bless someone, and watch the multiplication come back in Jesus' name. So bless you all from the Holy Land, from Israel, from the area of the actual feeding of the 5,000. Bless you all, in Jesus' name, amen. Now little did I know, because that was done a few weeks ago, little did I know that this last Wednesday, I was hungry for lunch, and I had a real busy schedule, and uh, uh, Kevin had brought his own meal, healthy meal, and I wanted something else, so, uh, Samantha was here and I was busy on the phone in meetings. I said, Sam, would you mind just going over and picking up, uh, I think we got a vermicelli uh, thing and um, I got for her too. So um, I gave her cash. I gave her two twenties. Now, I know someone on, I guess I heard that someone on our Facebook, my Facebook page kind of thought maybe two twenties were stuck together, but I'm pretty good with money. 
I'm pretty good that if I pull out two 20s and I check them, that they're single 20, single 20. You know, as missionaries of my whole life, I pretty much want to make sure I'm giving only 20 instead of five 20 stuck together, right, or whatever. So, so I was pretty sure to check it. I individualized them, pulled them out of my wallet, checked, and put them together, gave them to Samantha, and off she went. She comes back, I'm on the phone, uh, I think it was to, to actually our main church in Mexico, and, uh, and she came back with our two meals, and she put the receipt on the desk, on my desk, with a nickel and a 20. And I was actually surprised, I thought maybe they were like a little over 10 bucks a meal. How many of you know eating out's not cheap anymore? And I'd rather eat something like that than some Big Mac or whatever. But anyway, so, so I'm still talking, and I told her, go ahead and eat. So she starts eating, and I finish the phone call, and I'm eating, but I had this anointing oil. Oh, right there. I had it on my desk just sitting there because I was still kind of, I'm going to celebrate the miraculous. I'm not worshiping it. I worship God, but I celebrate the miraculous. Amen? And so uh, I was talking, and I said, oh, I said, was it... Was it less than $20, both our meals? And I thought that was the miracle. I thought they were actually like 11 bucks each or something like that. And she said, yeah, it worked out to the 1995. And I said, okay, so there's the nickel. And, and I grabbed the 20. She's looking across the desk at me. I grab the 20 in my hand, and I get this feeling. You get these supernatural feelings sometimes. You know, you just kind of, to me, I kind of go what I call a 50-50, but it's kind of like that feeling like, something's happening beyond my physical comprehension, you know? And as I grabbed it, I lifted it up in my hand, holding it tightly, and a 20 fell out. And I looked in my hand, and Samantha's like, I'm like, a 20. It multiplied. I, I said, Samantha, did you actually bless Dad and buy the meal? She said, no. I put your two 20s in the side of my purse here and pulled it out. Now, I know someone on the internet has already said, well, the, the, the new 20s, they're easy to stick together. You see, that's what, that's what stops a miracle from happening in your life if you have that mentality. So this morning, I don't know who that gentleman is, and please don't go on and bug him. I don't know if he's a man or a woman. Someone just told me this morning. I haven't even checked. But, so in the office, I pray that he has a multiplication. And we didn't, Chris didn't go after just 20s. He said, let's multiply the hundreds for that guy, for this person. Because the reality is, it, it makes reasonable sense that the 20s were just stuck together. It makes no reasonable sense if you understand how I checked the 20s before they went in Samantha's purse and when they came out and how tightly that 20 was in my hand that it was impossible for another one to have fallen out. But how many of you know God's a God of the impossible? Amen? So, little did I know, here we are prophesying over there. I was going to put it up on, on the internet, and I think I forgot, so I played it here this morning, and expect the increase. Expect the multiplication. If you don't expect it, it might surprise you. That would surprise me. But at the same time, I live a lifestyle of expectation. I'm expecting something to happen to you right now. I'm expecting to get an email from someone watching on, on TV right now. I, I have expectation just welling up inside of me. I have expectation, Kevin, Pastor Kevin, myself, and Pastor Chris Hicks from um, Windward High Prairie, Alberta. He's flying in today at 1, and we're jumping into the car, and we're heading down to Bethel. We're going off to a leader, be, uh, Bethel Leaders Network and Leadership Advance, and we're actually going to meet with Ivan and another pastor on month tomorrow. So we got driving to do tonight, and, and I'm expecting. I'm, I'm not going to drive all the way down there without expecting something. When I go to Disneyland, I expect Disneyland. If I go to McDonald's, I expect a McDonald's meal. If I come to Windward, I expect something to happen. I don't personally come here because... I want to do this. I do this because God's called me to do this and to do it with expectation. If I don't do it with expectation, I'm going to die. And I'll have my nice little three-part message, and I'll just read it to you. Verse 1 of chapter 5 of Matthew. Matthew 5, verse 1. And seeing the multitudes, 
he went up on the mountain. Because where the multiplication happens, that whole area, he hadn't multiplied it yet, but that whole area of Capernaum, it's all walking distance. It's absolutely amazing. So the first mountain, the first hill, is, is the Sermon on the Mount Hill. He went up to the mountain. When his disciples were seated, his disciples came to him, sorry. When he was seated, his disciples came to him, verse 2. Then he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. You get a rhythm here that it's not maybes? Let's just, let's just go back to verse 3 again. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. The kingdom of heaven. Blessed are, verse 4, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Verse 5, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. <laughs> that means I'm blessed. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Blessed are you and you shall Accomplish. Blessed are you. Blessed are you. If we listen to the nine ways to live. Because of time, I'm going to start next Sunday on Beatitude 1. Be this attitude, be attitude, be these attitudes, because if you are, then we can call, I'm sorry, then heaven calls you blessed. But if we don't grab these, I wonder how blessed you are. We're talking about son, blessed to be sons of God. I loved what Chris said this morning. Let me refresh my mind. What was it? No. He said something along the lines, I'm going to butcher it. Your problems are going to be here, but your faith gets bigger and grows as we have faith. And in other words, if, if your problem looks this big, the more faith you have, the smaller that problem looks. If you feel there's something blocking you or holding you back, or I, I loved what, um, what Lydia said this morning. Did you hear what she said? It was during a Father's Day message in this house. And I talked something about forgiving and forgiveness of some kind and how many times she had forgiven her dad, but something clicked and she went after it. I, I have no doubt in my mind that so many people have such a tough life because of unforgiveness. Unforgiveness is one of the roots of the devil. It's absolutely anti-Christ to Christianity. This is what I'm saying. Because Christianity is all about forgiveness. 
It's about the love of the Father sending His one and only Son, Jesus Christ, to hang on a tree. You know, God had the power and the authority to not make it happen. Jesus had the power and the authority to have stopped it. But because of the love of God for every one of us in this house, on that television, and throughout this world, every person is so loved by God. Even all those sinners are loved by God. All those false religions, they're all loved by God. He's not in agreement with their falsities. But he loves them because he created them. And they're waiting to hear the good news. They're waiting to see the power of the testimony of a Christ follower, a Christ walker, a Christian. I I get back from Reading. I'm here on we get back Saturday, I'm here next Sunday, and then I think I'm here that week, and then it's Easter, and that's Friday night's going to be crazy, powerful. It's a young adult band that's just going to give it. So bring your earplugs. Don't need to. Let them get cleaned out. We're going to see where God goes on that Friday night. But I sensed in my spirit on Easter Sunday that I need to open up the opportunity that if somebody in this place or you know somebody that needs to be baptized that wants to be baptized, I'll go fill the tank up for Sunday morning. That's Easter Sunday, two Sundays away. I'll fill the tank up. I'll, I'll, I'll dip. I'll dip in our Jordan here. We're on well water, so the water's a little brownish colored. It's safe. It just looks like the River Jordan when it's in the tank. So pass the word, pass the news. Maybe you've been baptized before. Well, get baptized again if God laid it on your heart. What, can I do that? Oh, sure, why not? I did. That doesn't mean it make it right, but I'll tell you what. Let's get out of our mindset that we figured it all out at 12 years old. His love for us is so great. On Easter Monday, I fly off to Mexico. We're doing crusades there. I get back from Mexico. One day later, I'm off to Pakistan into the largest crusades in Karachi in the stadium of Pakistan, Karachi Stadium. The president of Pakistan has, is coming to the crusades and has already asked for a meeting with me. He's either kicking me out or he's accepting me in. I don't know. I'm just kidding. The president of Pakistan I've never been to Pakistan. It'll be my 46th country. Two to 3,000 pastors are coming together. I'm I'm teaching them two days in a row, teaching them. And the guy, uh, they called me last night, or actually yesterday morning, late night for them. And they said, Brent, Brother Brent, what should we call the conference for the leaders? I said, something to do with kingdom. I just feel kingdom. heaven is at hand. I get back back from Pakistan for one day and I get on the plane to Korea. Even I think my fifth time into Korea consecutively for the last five years. But you know what? They're hungry. Prayer warriors. And then I come home from Korea and I'm home for a while. Thank you, Jesus. For the rest of May and I say this for a reason. The romance of travel wore off when I was a little kid. But the conviction to go into all the world and preach the gospel, I pray, will never wear off. And this ministry has been built on it. That we're going to take the word of God. Our constitution even says it goes something along the lines of we'll use airplanes, television, Uh, boats, cars, everything possible to preach the gospel to the nations of this world. Everything that you help sow into this ministry, we tithe out of it to the nations and above. It's what we do. I want to thank you personally if you're part of this family. Thank you. But quit sending me away so much. No, I'm just kidding. But thank you. Right now, there's a grace on the travel, which gives a grace to the family. When 
dads traveling, there's grace. Because we have mamas and papas in this house. We have leaders that have a passion for God. We have ministries birthed out of this house, going to nations, connected. It's just an amazing thing. I, pr I pray. Read through the Beatitudes this week because next Sunday I'm going to start. We're going to go through them. I'm going to try to open up an understanding of the Greek and the Hebrew wording and try to walk through it because we need these nine habitudes in our lives. We need them in our marriages. We need them in our families. We need them in our churches. We need them in our businesses. We need them in everything we do in life. Let's all stand. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. The last one. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Ah, a little persecution here and there. It keeps us strong. I quit asking for God to humble me. I used to cry out, oh God, humble me. Ow! I didn't mean like that. But everything that you've experienced and walked through in life has a purpose and a testimony to celebrate God's glory. Every bad thing that was ever done to you in life, turn it around and learn from the power of testimony that you now have the victory over every of those bad things. And you become a power of testimony to others around you to be released in the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, to see the great fire of his presence pour upon each one of us. You get the choice when you walk out of these doors today to walk out the same or to walk out changed. Those doors won't change you. They're just metal and glass. This building won't change you. This is just keeping us out of the rain, snow. I can't change you. I'm just a deliverer of this word. That's my goal. That's what I'm called to do is to deliver this. But I'm speaking about someone who can change you. And of course, we always say, Jesus, change me. Father, change me. Holy Spirit, change me. Do you know what I feel? What I'm hearing from heaven right now is all of heaven, the three in one, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are saying the decision is yours. We've already opened the door. So, Father... I change me. <laughs> I open my heart to your fullness. I know your fullness will kill me. And I'm ready to die. I'll die to self every day. I know your supernatural realm doesn't make sense. And sure, I could think, well, maybe Lydia really wasn't sick. Maybe she never really had any pain. I don't know who she is. Maybe that 20 was stuck together. Maybe the oil. Maybe I forgot to take the seal off the top. <laughs> you know what, devil? I'm going to do what Steve Backlund does and just laugh at that. <laughs> because that's just dumb thinking right there. <laughs> That's just dumb thinking. To always go after the non-miraculous is just dumb. The spirit is stupid. Did I say that? The spirit of dumb, that sounds nicer. Father, I have chosen years ago that when I hear someone's testimony, I'm not the judge of their testimony. I'm to celebrate the victory with them because your word will never come back void. And when your name is being exalted in a sign and a wonder, if someone's lying about it, I'm still going to celebrate because you can still do it. <laughs> because you're just the miracle walker and the miracle worker. So Father God, I thank you for this family and the families of this valley for every church 
in the Pacific Northwest, across Canada and America and around the world. We pray blessings, manifold blessings upon them, Father. There are brothers and our sisters, Father. They believe that you are the risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And they believe in the foundation of this word. They are our brothers and sisters. Even if they might not like a piano or a guitar is not good for them, that's fine. We're going to dance together and I'll teach them how to play in heaven. Uh, I thank you, Father, for your kingdom has come and your will is being done on earth here in us as it is in heaven. That you give us this day our daily bread and you have forgiven our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. You don't lead us into temptation. You deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, and it is the power. It's the authority. It's the ecclesia. It's the governmental structure of the kingdom of heaven at hand. Built on the apostles and the prophets with Christ as the chief cornerstone. Let us never be the same. Let us continually be changing and growing in your love and in your presence, in your power and in your authority. In the name of Jesus Christ, our living, 